Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. Last week we finished examining the cross-handed blessing of Jacob. It was told in Genesis 48. Now this was a prophetic blessing made upon Ephraim and Manasseh, but the primary target of this blessing was Ephraim. Now we discovered that Ephraim would in some way, not yet fully clear, be a blessing to the Gentile world. And we, as, as we looked yet again at Ezekiel 37, we learned why the prophecy that Ephraim and Judah would be reunited in the land of Israel, never to be removed, had everything to do with what we're witnessing today, with the goings-on in Israel in our time. Now this week we're going to look at another separate set of blessings made by Jacob. Recall that we are speaking of a time when the twelve tribes of Israel were still in Egypt, Joseph was the vizier of Egypt, and Israel was honored guests of the Pharaoh. So it's probably around 1700 to 1750 BC when the events of Genesis 48 and 49 occurred. Now in Genesis 49, we're going to look at the destinies as described in the form of blessings which were prophetically called out for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We have come a long way, haven't we? In earlier parts of Genesis, we saw Israel created by God via giving Jacob a name transplant from Jacob to Israel. And now we will see prophecies concerning the future of these individual tribes of Israel called out hundreds of years before their fulfillment. Much of what we will learn about them is already fulfilled prophecy. What we can take from this is the absolute inerrancy and the literal nature, and that's important, the literal nature of biblical prophecy. And that is important to us in our time because there are still many prophecies about the tribes of Israel that are in the process of being fulfilled. Others soon will be. Now, true enough, some of these prophecies remain a bit obscure and they're meaning a little cloudy, but the fog's starting to lift. I think if you pay close attention to what we're going to study about these tribes, the book of Revelation in particular will have a new meaning to you. Recall that last week, for instance, we discovered that the makeup of the 12 tribes of Israel looks different in Revelation 7 than it does in the Torah, with Ephraim and Dan being removed, Joseph and Levi being added back in. And as we read through Genesis 49, we need to put it in the proper perspective. What Jacob was pronouncing was panoramic pictures of each of these tribes. These were not prophecies about things that these tribes would necessarily do. They were prophecies about what each of these tribes would become. Jacob would pronounce what each of these tribes' characteristics, their attributes would be over the long haul. Not exactly how they would behave at any given moment in time or at every circumstance, although we can see moments when the actions of a certain tribe eerily reflect the blessing that Jacob gave to them. We need to keep in mind that it was more than 3,500 years ago that Jacob made these pronouncements concerning what the traits of the descendants of the sons gathered around his deathbed were going to look like. If one could look at history, at the history of each tribe from the beginning to the end as a total. And let's remember, from here on out, when the Bible speaks of one of the twelve tribes of Israel, such as Reuben or Judah or Ephraim, it's not speaking about the destiny of any particular man, 
Because for these men, these 12 sons of Jacob, were long dead before the individual tribes that went by their names even grew large enough to form identifiable characteristics. Rather, the Bible is speaking of the thousands and millions of descendants of each of these men who stayed together in family groups called tribes. This was the typical societal structure then. And it might surprise you to know that the largest part of the world today is still tribal in societal structure. The largest part. So far from tribalism being a thing of the past, it's alive and it's well and it's how it how it operates, that has everything to do with the intractable, intractable troubles that we face today in the Middle East, as well as the horrible genocides that we see in modern day Africa. Well, let's read Genesis 49 together. Genesis chapter 49. Open your Bibles if you have a complete Jewish Bible to page. 50 what? 56. Thank you. Uh, we're going to read the whole chapter. Genesis chapter 49. Amazing pivotal chapter in the Torah. Then Yaakov, Jacob, Israel, called for his sons and said, Gather yourselves together and I will tell you what will happen to you in the Akhrit Hayamim, the world to come. Assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Jacob. Pay attention to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength, the first fruits of my manhood. Though superior in vigor and power, you are unstable as water, so your superiority will end, because you climbed into your father's bed and you defiled it. He climbed onto my concubine's couch. Shimon and Levi are brothers, related by weapons of violence. Let me not enter into their council. Let my honor not be connected with their people, for in their anger they killed men. At their whim they maimed cattle. Cursed be their anger, for it's been fierce. Their fury gets been cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, scatter them in Israel. Now Judah, your brothers, will acknowledge you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. My son, you stand over the prey. He crouches down and stretches like a lion, like a lioness, who dares to provoke him. The scepter will not pass from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his legs, until he comes to whom obedience belongs. It is he whom the peoples will obey, tying his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice grapevine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun will live at the seashore, with ships anchoring along his coast and at, the, at his border at Sidon. Yisachar is a strong donkey lying down in the sheep's sheds. On seeing how good is settled life, how pleasant the country, he'll bend his back to the burden, and submit to forced labor. Dan will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a viper on the road, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so its rider falls off backwards. I wait for your deliverance, Adonai. Gad, a troop will troop on him, but he will troop on their heel. Asher's food is rich. He will provide food fit for a king. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Joseph is a fruitful plant. A fruitful plant by a spring, with branches climbing over the wall. The archers attack him fiercely, shooting at him, pressing him hard. But his bow remained taut, and his arms were made nimble by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there, from the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you, by El Shaddai who will bless you with blessings from heaven above. Blessings from the deep, lying below, Blessings from the breasts and the womb. The blessings of your father are more powerful than the blessings of my parents. Extending to the farthest of the everlasting hills, they will be on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Binyamin, Benjamin, is a ravenous wolf. 
in the morning devouring the prey, in the evening dividing the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is how their father spoke to them and blessed them, giving each his own individual blessing. Then he charged them as follows, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my ancestors in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah by Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Avraham bought, bought together with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a burial place belonging to him. There they buried Avraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Itzak and his wife Rivka. There I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it, which was purchased from the sons of Heth, when Jacob had finished charging his sons, he drew up his legs unto the bed, he breathed his last, and he was gathered to his people. Like a modern day family sitting around a table while an executor reads the will of the departed one who held sway on all the family wealth and power, there was this heir of anticipation among these twelve brothers, twelve sons of Jacob. The twelve sons of Jacob were anxiously waiting to hear what their particular blessing might be. And like the family at the reading of the will, some were going to be pleasantly surprised at their portion, others were going to be devastated with disappointment. Still others would walk away with content, however their modest was their lot. Now later, after it all had time to sink in. Hard feelings would also likely result, as some of these sons of Jacob who received the lesser blessing burned with envy against those who received the greater. Of course, those who received the greatest blessings looked down smugly upon those who never deserved as much as they had rightly received anyway. And time doesn't necessarily solve these hurts and rejections. Sometimes the passing of years can actually magnify the animosity. Such would be the case as we follow the history of Israel from this point forward. Because we will find some of the tribes of Israel will have long-term hatred against other tribes of Israel. At times they'll actually war against one another. Well, the twelve sons of the last living patriarch, Jacob, called Israel, gathered around their father who has just enough strength left in that aged body to perform his final duty on earth. And they listen intently as the all-important blessings begin, predictably, with Reuben, the firstborn. And they progress in approximate, but not exact, accordance with the order of their birth. So in verse 1, Jacob begins by saying something that has an unclear meaning even to scholars to this day. He says that I may tell you what shall befall you in the days to come. Some versions say in the latter days, other verses say in the last days. The Hebrew word used here is achrit hayamim. In its most literal, it means the end of days. Some rabbis and scholars say that this speaks of a time when Israel's days in Egypt will be over, and then Moses leads them out. Others say this is speaking of the, of the latter days and end times of the whole world, as, as we're so prone to call it today. There have been very reasonable arguments for both sides. Probably Jacob's sons were not thinking in terms of thousands of years into the future. But as with every pronouncement in the Bible that is of God, as were these blessings, we must remain aware that there is simultaneously a physical and a spiritual manifestation. Certainly Jacob's sons could only see the tangible, physical, material side of it. But we, with hindsight, can also see the spiritual side of it. About a thousand years after this blessing, Ten of those twelve tribes, all but Judah and Benjamin, and that tribe of special category, the Levites, would all but vanish. Therefore, one would have to think that indeed the meaning of Jacob's words, the end of days or the world to come, or whatever way you want to translate it, 
spoke of a time before they vanished. A time that represented the state of each tribe in the years that would lead up their exodus from Egypt. This is as opposed to Jacob's words referring to the end times of the, of the world, end times of history. Yet as we're just now suddenly aware that Ephraim, who represents all those so-called lost tribes, is supposed to mysteriously reappear. Somehow or another, some form or another, in the end times, it does leave open the possibility that indeed Jacob was seeing to the end of the world and not simply the end of e Israel's time in Egypt. Of course, it could mean both. Time will tell. Likely, it does have elements of both past and future, for, for we see many biblical prophecies repeat themselves in that way. They happen and they happen again. Bible prophecy tends to create patterns as much as they foretell future events. For the present, I prefer to leave this as a mystery rather than to dogmatically say it means one thing over the other. Perhaps over the next few months and years, God will make this a little bit clearer to us. With that, let's examine the blessings that are given to each and every son. Going back to Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength, the firstfruits of my manhood. Though superior in vigor and power, you are unstable as water, so your superiority will end. This is because you climbed into your father's bed and defiled it. He climbed onto my concubine's couch. Okay. Although we're not told the reaction of any of the sons, it should not be hard to imagine the crushing blow this dealt to Reuben, because at this instant, humiliated, in front of his brothers. He was disowned from his natural position as the firstborn of Israel. One can imagine he should have suspected such a result, particularly since his younger brother Judah had been relied on more and more by Jacob for family leadership over the past few years. Reuben knew the wrongs he'd committed against his father. But hit with the unalterable finality of it, a brutally depressed Reuben had to be the result. Jacob says of Reuben, you're unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you defiled my bed. In other words, you do not have the necessary attributes to lead Israel. So you shall not receive the firstborn blessing. This bed defiling incident is recalled for us in the book of Chronicles. We need to take, a very, take in very carefully what this passage says. See, because it's key to our understanding of the blessings that Jacob will give his sons and, and more. In 1 Chronicles 5, 1 and 2, it says this. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was the firstborn. But because he defiled his father's bread, bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph the son of Israel, though not in such a way as for him to be regarded in the genealogy as the firstborn. For Judah became greater than his brothers, inasmuch as the ruler came from him. Nevertheless, the birthright went to Joseph. Important piece of information. In a long way around the barn, this tells us a couple of things. First, the cause of Jacob passing over Reuben was because he had slept with Jacob's concubine, Bila. Straightforward enough. But what also happened was, in essence, the honors and blessings that traditionally went to the firstborn actually got split between two other sons, Joseph and Judah. Or as we saw in Genesis 48, Actually, the firstborn rights got split between Ephraim, who's Joseph's natural son, and Judah, Jacob's natural son. So, the chronicler tells us that the earthly reason behind Jacob's cross-handed blessing upon Joseph's sons was to disinherit Reuben because of what Reuben had done. Of course, 
God had other reasons to allow this scenario to unfold as well. Now, there are two major components that make up the traditional firstborn blessing. First was the double portion, which meant that the firstborn was to receive two shares or more of the tribe's wealth, instead of just one, an equal share. Second was that the firstborn was given the right of authority to lead, to rule over the, the whole tribe. If all had gone as normal, Reuben would not only have been the leader of the tribe his own birth had created, the tribe of Reuben, he would have become the leader over all Israel. He would have ruled in his father's, Jacob's place, over the full 12 tribes. And he would have received a double portion, twice as much as the, of the tribe's wealth as any of his brothers received. Reuben got none of this. Instead, we see that Joseph would receive the double portion by means of his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and Judah would receive the right to rule and lead. Now, I'll tell you, this is a strange action that Jacob took in splitting the firstborn blessing. But also keep in mind an important element that the writer of Chronicles explains. Genealogically speaking, Judah's family would be the one who would carry forth authority. Important. But also keep in mind this. In matters where genealogy was the deciding factor, such as who would be the first legitimate king of Israel, David, who would be king forever, Yeshua, it would be Judah's bloodlines that would be used, not Joseph's, not Reuben's. Yet in a strange way, Joseph also received the firstborn blessing. And I want to show you how that happened. See, often we will see the Bible use the terms double portion blessing and birthright and firstborn blessing, all of these terms interchangeably. But we need to understand that even though on the common vernacular of that day, the term double portion was used synonymously with firstborn blessing, technically the double portion was only one part of the firstborn blessing. It was assumed, according to tradition, custom, that whoever was awarded the firstborn blessing got every element that traditionally went with it. That is, whoever received the double portion of the family's wealth also automatically received the right to rule over the tribe. But Jacob did something very novel in splitting the firstborn blessing between two heirs, two sons, two tribes of Israel. Now, in my opinion, the reason that the writer of Chronicles worded these verses in the ways that he did is because he didn't fully comprehend what it all meant, what it was all going to lead to. Why the firstborn blessing was divided between two sons the writer obviously didn't know because it was, wasn't usually done in this manner. In fact, I'm unaware of anywhere else in the Bible that the splitting of the firstborn blessing would occur again, as happened with Jacob. This seems to be unique. So all the writer of Chronicles does is report facts as he understands them without any explanation. Now let's see how Jacob's blessing of Reuben worked out. The prophecy that Reuben's descendants would be as unstable as water and that they would not be leaders. When we search the scriptures, we find the tribe of Reuben did not produce one single military leader. Not a king, not a prophet, not a judge, not one. Not one of Reuben's descendants are mentioned in the Bible as having attained a position, a position of particular value or honor or accomplished anything of any significance. We also find that after the 12 tribes approached the promised land of Canaan led by Moses, the tribe of Reuben decided not to enter the promised land. They decided to settle for good enough. 
They took some territory as their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River, outside of Canaan. We even find that Reuben's tribe began a steady decline in their population. Moses was so concerned about the condition of the tribe of Reuben that he prayed in Deuteronomy 33, 6, Oh God, let Reuben live and not die. Let not his men be so few. The tribe of Reuben was destined to become an asterisk in the history of Israel. This was all due to Reuben's unstable ways and the result of his sin. It is a simple but profound biblical principle that while our sins can be forgiven and paid for, the earthly consequences of our sins can be enduring throughout our lifetimes and on into the lives of our children and our children's children and beyond that. We may not like that very much, but it's so. Our simple ways can introduce characteristics into our families that are detrimental and long-lasting in their effects. And all we have to do is live long enough to know the truth of that. Well, next we read of the prophetic blessings pronounced upon the two tribes of Simeon and Levi. So we're going to reread 40, Genesis 49, 5 through 7. Shimon and Levi are brothers, related by weapons of violence. Let, my, uh, let me not enter their council. Let my honor not be connected with their people. For in their anger they killed men, and at their whim they maimed cattle. Cursed be their anger, for it's been fierce, their fury, because it's been cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Another harsh verdict. And undoubtedly, two more very stunned inheritors. Jacob sees his second and third born sons in the same light, having similar personal attributes, similar characteristics, and therefore apparently, and I underline the word apparently, sharing a common destiny. He says they're brothers in violence, so they shall be brothers in their suffering from their transgressions. Now, unlike Reuben's primary offense, which was done in secret, Shimon and Levi had committed their greatest offense for everyone to see, and they were proud, and they were unrepentant for what they had done. Let's revisit just what the great offense of Shimon and Levi was. It's told in Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is on page 37. Page 37. We're going to read verses 1 and 2, 5, 7, 13, through 15. We're going to skip around just to kind of make it go faster. One time Dinah, the daughter of Leah, uh, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the local girls, and Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the local ruler, saw her, grabbed her, raped her, and humiliated her jumping down to five. When Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, his sons were with his, with his livestock in the field. So Jacob restrained himself until they came. Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, just as Jacob's sons were coming in from the field. And when they heard what had happened, the men were saddened, were very angry at, this, at the outrage this man had committed against Israel by raping Jacob's daughter, something that is simply not done, skipping down to 13. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They said to him, said to them, We can't do it, because it would be a disgrace to give our sister to someone who hasn't been circumcised. Only on this condition will we consent to what you're asking for, that you become like us by having every male among you get circumcised. Then skipping to verse 25. On the third day after the circumcision, when they were in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Shimon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords, boldly descended on the city, and slaughtered all the males. They killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with their swords, 
So De and took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and they left. Then the sons of Jacob entered over the dead bodies of those who had been slaughtered and plundered the city in reprisal for defiling their sister. Well, the primary thrust of this blessing was that neither Shimon nor Levi would partake in the promised land in the same proportion as their brothers. This is a result of their bloodlust, their cruelty, that was committed upon the helpless and innocent citizens of Shechem. Simeon and Levi would instead, we're told, be divided and scattered. And that is exactly what took place. But let me give you a hint in advance of our look at what happened to Simeon and Levi. Remember that one of God's governing dynamics is to divide, separate, and elect. It is a deceived mankind that looks upon division as a negative. Well, let's look first at Simeon. At what he would become, as he would become the smallest tribe by the time of the census that takes place in Numbers chapter 26. And like Reuben, Simeon struggled just to exist, to maintain a, a separate tribal identity. In a census reported in the early part of the book of Numbers, some, uh, Simeon is said to have had a population of about 59,300. Within a mere 40 years, however, the census of number 20, uh, Numbers 26 shows their population had shrunk by over 50% to 22,200. Now, just for the sake of clarity, the census would have been only of men, only of men really in their prime and middle portions of their lives. This is often expressed in the Hebrew idiom as men capable of bearing arms. That's who's counted. So this is probably something on the order of males from 20 to 50 years old. Males younger and older than this, females, children, the elderly, the disabled, none of these were counted in the census. Neither females of any age weren't counted. Now further, when we find Moses officiating, over the handing out of the tribal lands, their, their inheritances, Simeon was given territory where? Within Judah's territory. Technically, and more accurately, it was certain cities within Judah's territory. Simeon's territory was like the round bullseye in the center of a target. Simeon was completely surrounded by the tribe of Judah. Worse yet, the area that they occupied within Judah was primarily the Negev, a very arid desert. Simeon was probably the first tribe to be completely absorbed by the other tribes, with some of them joining with Judah, others joining with what would eventually come to be known as the ten northern tribes that formed Ephraim. There was even mention in 1 Chronicles of some members of the tribe of Simeon, leaving the Holy Land altogether and joining with Edom. Now, recall that Edom was the descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother. Jacob said they'd be scattered, and man, how, proved, how true that proved to be. Now, Levi suffered a similar, though not as destructive, fate as concerns land and territory. Levi, as with Simeon, was not given its own territory per se. Rather, it too was given cities, but they were given 48 cities. But these cities were scattered over all the tribes, within all the tribal boundaries of every tribe. However, Levi was divided and separated out to become God's own priests in Hebrew, Kohanim. It was the Levites who would officiate all matters at the wilderness tabernacle and then later on in the temple. So while Simeon was destined to the loss of its tribal identity, almost to near extinction, Le Levi's separation from Israel became actually a holy matter. Now, what an incredible thing it is that Jacob's prophecy so accurately depicts the ironically similar, yet opposite, fates of Simeon and Levi. Look once again at verse 7, at the end of it. 
where it says, I will divide them in Jacob, I will scatter them in Israel. Both actions happened, but each in its own way. Levi was divided, separated, elected away from the other tribes, but to become priests to God. Simeon was utterly scattered into all the other tribes of Israel. Levi maintained their identity. Simeon lost theirs. Now, often we will see in Scripture two phrases or sentences back to back which appear to simply be a a repetition. Like in verse 7, I will divide, I will scatter. Usually, this is merely a standard Hebrew literary device called a doublet or a couplet. At other times, though, there is a subtle and important message that's being introduced, and it's not the same thing being said just in two different ways. It's different. It's meant to be different. But I also want to mention as an aside that whereas particularly in the prophets, it looks to be unarguable that there is much repetition of phrases. In fact, it's because of the near impossibility to translate a Hebrew word structure directly into English. Very difficult. One of the reasons that this is so is because the Bible was originally created in a structure, a grammatical structure, that was meant to be learned through the spoken word and therefore through hearing. This is opposed as to our English, Latin, French, German translations that were written in a style that were meant to be absorbed by reading the words. Now, while to those of us who are not literary professionals, the difference between creating a speech that's meant to be absorbed by the ears versus creating a manuscript designed to be absorbed by the eyes may not be all that apparent, but the differences are substantial. It is interesting to notice that even up to our time, the Levites are seen as separate from the remainder of Israel. Jews do not regard Levites as Jews. They are separate. They are distinct, at least when the privileges according to the Levites are involved. They're separate and distinct. Even if the rest of the world through ignorance doesn't make this distinction, God does. And considering where we now are in prophetic times, it's probably wise for us to understand and acknowledge it because the time is getting near. The Levites are going to once again play a very prominent role in Judaism. So the end result of Jacob's pronouncements are that the first three brothers, all the eldest, are now essentially dispossessed and their blessings look a lot more like curses, at least right now. I'm sure to them as they stand around listening to this. Now we come to the fourth in line, Judah. Let's go back to our Bibles and look at 49 verses 8 through 12. Judah, your brothers will acknowledge you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. My son, you stand over the prey. He crouches down and stretches like a lion, like a lioness, who dares to provoke him. The scepter will not pass from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his legs, until he comes to whom obedience belongs. And it is he whom the peoples will obey. Tying his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice grapevine, he washes his clothes in wine, he robes in the blood of grapes, His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. The first thing that we notice is that Jacob has a lot more to say to Judah than to any of Judah's older brothers. Many excellent commentaries now tell us that Judah here receives the firstborn, firstborn blessing. Well, as we've learned, that's only partially true. As I mentioned earlier, what Judah actually receives is only one part of the two-part blessing that goes to the firstborn. And since there are two primary elements to that firstborn blessing, receiving the double amount of tribal wealth as any other inheritor, and the official assumption of the leadership 
and authority over the tribe, we see that Judah inherited only the second part of the blessing, tribal authority and leadership. Back in Genesis 48, Joseph was given the other part of the firstborn, uh, firstborn blessing, that double portion, and it was in the form of making Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, equal with all of Jacob's sons. So Joseph received, essentially, two-twelfths of all that was Israel through his two sons. Judah's the lion, an ancient symbol of regal status. Judah is also the new leader of Israel, and true to his name, Judah, which means praise, he will have the praise of his brothers, and eventually the whole world, because out of him will come God's anointed kings of Israel and the Messiah. The royal line of David will come from the tribe of Judah, and the right to rule Israel will remain with the tribe of Judah until finally Shiloh comes. Take a look at verse 10. Take a look at verse 10. This is another controversial verse in this chapter. Some Bibles use, like mine, words similar to, to whom obedience belongs. That's in place of the word Shiloh. Now let's take a look at this because it's quite interesting, if not quite important. First of all, the word Shiloh, we typically say Shiloh, but it's Shiloh, appears in the oldest manuscripts that we have and in the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was created 250 years before Christ was born. So the word Shiloh, by everything reasonably evident, is part of the original text. Now later on in the Old Testament, we are going to see that there is a town in Canaan called Shiloh. Shiloh. And it's there that the tabernacle of, uh, of the wilderness will rest for many years. Interestingly, Shiloh will be in the, in the territory of Ephraim. Now this is actually the first holy city in the Holy Land. And while we all think of Jerusalem in that regard, in reality, Shiloh was first. And later, the honor of being the holiest city was transferred to Jerusalem. But even then, Shiloh remained a holy city in Israel for centuries to come, second only in importance to Jerusalem. Now, some scholars believe that the city of Shiloh is what's being referred to in this verse, though, of course, it wasn't in existence at this time. But if we render the meaning of Shiloh and Jacob's blessing to be the name of a future city, the verse doesn't make a lot of sense. For most, for, for most certainly the scepter, meaning the, the authority to rule, did not depart from Judah when the city of Shiloh was founded, nor did Judah's leadership decline, as prophesied here. So we shouldn't take this to mean the city of Shiloh. The next popular explanation is that Shiloh is but a word that has the meaning of to whom obedience belongs. And that's what we find in most Bible versions. Now, while this most certainly has the implication of referring to a Messiah, in order to achieve this meaning, it assumes that one of the letters in the word Shiloh was handed down to us incorrectly. That is, that the Hebrew was misspelled, that the letter Sheen should have been a Sin. That's that little three-pronged letter. There is no evidence that this is the case. And even if it seems to afford us a very nice, easy answer to what Shiloh is, we should not accept such a thing that doesn't trust the Scripture to be what it is, without modifying it to help achieve an answer that suits what we prefer. The last and most appropriate explanation is that Shiloh is another name for the Messiah. In other words, Shiloh is a proper noun. In this case, it's a name. Now, what's kind of ironic is that the previous explanation is an attempt to prove 
the messianic nature of this verse by modern day Christians who regarded the original Hebrew word Shiloh as having no literal meaning that they could figure out, so they made one up. Yet beginning with the most ancient Hebrew commentary in existence called Bereshit Rabbah, the majority of Hebrew sages and scholars from times long past agreed that Shiloh is purely messianic in its nature. It speaks of the Messiah, Shiloh. So in the end, if Christians had not for the last 1900 years or so harbored such an animosity towards the Jews, they could have had very early sources for their beliefs that the Shiloh was indeed talking about the coming Yeshua of Nazareth. Instead, we've twisted around some meanings to our shame that eventually wound up with the same results anyway. So beginning right here in Genesis 49, it is prophesied that the Messiah will come from the Hebrews, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Judah, the family of David. All the way back here in Genesis 49. Think of that. With the benefit of hindsight, we now have, knowing who the Messiah is, it would in no way be incorrect to read Genesis 49.10 as fulfilled prophecy. The scepter shall not pass from Judah or the ruler's staff from between his legs until it's handed over to Yeshua. And of course, that rulership has indeed been passed permanently to him. One more thing about Judah and we'll move on. Religious Jews have a big problem today. They continue to assert correctly that the Messiah, or at least one of the Messiahs, because many, many Jews believe there will be two, is to be from the tribe of Judah and more precisely from the Jewish royal family of David. But of course, they do not acknowledge that Yeshua, who revealed himself around 30 AD, is that Messiah. So the problem is that when they, that expected day arrives and a Mashiach, reveals himself as such, how will the Jews ever be able to prove that it's actually him in the manner they prefer to prove such things? By genealogy. How are they going to prove it? Because in 70 AD, the House of Records in Jerusalem and every document that proved the lineage of every Jewish family was destroyed. Coupled with the nearly 1900 year exile and dispersal they have suffered through after that, before returning to a reborn Israel in 1948, there is absolutely no way for anyone alive today claiming to be Jewish to prove it genealogically. Yeshua was able to prove it, and his genealogy has never been, right up to this day, disputed. By the Jews. Even ultra Orthodox Jews today readily admit that Yeshua of Nazareth existed, that he was of the tribe of Judah, that he was of the line of David. That is not in dispute. Yet, due to the spiritual blindness that has overcome so many Israelites, they cannot see the reality of Yeshua being the Messiah, or that it is hopeless that they could, by their own requirements, ever prove that whoever they think is going to be the Messiah actually is. And for some of you that may not realize it, there is a huge group of Jews today, about half of a group called Chabad. You've probably heard of Chabad because we've actually got a chapter of Chabad right here in Brevard, about half of Chabad thinks that Messiah has come and that his name is Rabbi Schneerson. It's true. Now, Schneerson died several years ago. But one group of Chabad, Chabad actually split over this issue. Half of them believe that Schneerson is, is, was the Messiah and believe that he's going to reappear anytime. 
The other half of Chabad, and I don't know if it's half and half, but they split, absolutely does not believe this. So that's a, now a split group. Anyway, next week, we're going to look at the remaining tribes' blessings, beginning with the last two children that Leah, Jacob's first wife, bore to him. In only about three weeks, we're going to be starting Exodus, folks. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.